Conway Hall, London, where ethics matter. Welcome back. Um, been a great day so far. Um, thank you all for sticking with us. And um, yeah, look forward to seeing some of you for a beer later. Thanks, Deborah. She'll be back chairing in a short while, um, but I thought I could just get my face in. Um, I'm carrying on with the theme of, uh, well, literally haunted landscapes, which we have been having, uh, our next speaker is Sophia Kingshill, who the author of, um, as you can see from the back, um, Law of Scotland, uh, the Horn the, the, the Fable Coast. I always want to call it the Haunted Shore. Or or Law of the Shore, sorry, The Fable Coast, uh, a collection of uh, British folklore of the, of the sea and the coast. And um, children's, well, I should have done my preparation. And The Raven and the Crow? Uh, yeah, yes, indeed. And the, the, the children's uh, fantasy novel, Raven and the Crow. Um, so far as I remember, the Folklore Society and researcher and great thinker and one of our best speakers. We had her at the first Haunted Landscape. Um, her talk is uh, Bog Gothic images of an ambivalent landscape. And here to explain to us how that ambivalent landscape is also haunted, please welcome Sophia Kingshill. Thank you. So I press, so if I press this, yes, I, yes. The bog went on and on over the horizon and out of my knowledge. Of all the enemies of man, I think that the red bog, as we call in Ireland, that wide wilderness of heather, seems the most friendly. It lulls him and soothes him all his days. It gives him myriads of pieces of sky to look at about his feet, and mosses more brilliant than anything short of jewellery and the great glow of the heather. And if ever it sees him luring his step with its mosses, it so tends him and cherishes him that those who chance upon him and dig him up find one whose face and skin are as of their own contemporaries, yet not the oldest in the district know him, for he may have been dead for ages. That's from The Curse of the Wise Woman by Lord Dunsany. What he says about the bog tending and cherishing is absolutely true. Because bog water is acidic and without oxygen, it preserves whatever lies in it. Weapons or textiles, tree trunks or butter, and most remarkably, human beings. The oldest body ever dug up from a peat bog is Kölberg man from Denmark, who lived 10,000 years ago. And bodies from the Iron Age have been discovered in a quite extraordinary state of perfection. This is Tolland man, also found in a Danish bog. Hundreds of such bodies have been found in the bogs and swamps of Europe most dating from between 100 BC and 400 AD, but many looking as though they died so recently that often the first response of those who come across them is to call the police, thinking that they've stumbled on a modern murder victim. This life-in-death magic is one of the physical characteristics of bogs and swamps that contributes to their mystique, Another is their reputation as bottomless, something that can be found in early literature. A few miles from here, a frost-stiffened wood waits and keeps watch above a mere. The overhanging bank is a maze of tree roots mirrored in its surface. At night there, something uncanny happens. The water burns and the mere bottom has never been sounded by the sons of men. The dangers of Bogland figure in all kinds of sensational writing, most famously perhaps in The Hound of the Baskervilles. It is a wonderful place, the moor, says the butterfly collector Stapleton. 
It is so vast and so barren and so mysterious. You see, for example, this great plain to the north here with the queer hills breaking out of it. You notice those bright green spots upon it. Yes, says Dr. Watson, they seem more fertile than the rest. Stapleton laughed. That is the great Grimpen Mire, said he. A false step yonder means death to man or beast. Even as they watch, a moor pony drowns in a bog hole with a cry that turns Watson cold with horror, although Stapleton is unmoved. And in the end, of course, the villain Stapleton himself is sucked down by the foul slime of the huge morass. Conan Doyle, writing in 1902, might easily have been reading John Page's Exploration of Dartmoor, published 10 years earlier. The seething and quaking bog consists of a thin layer of sodden moss above a substratum of black slime and water. A slight thrust with a pole will cause the mass to emit a seething and hissing noise, and presently the surface commences to quiver in a manner most remarkable. It need hardly be stated that the incautious pedestrian who steps upon one of these treacherous patches stands every chance of breaking through, and if he found no bottom, woe betide him. But common care will enable him to escape the Dartmoor stables, as the Moor men expressively call these pitfalls, owing to the loss of an occasional pony therein. And if he carefully avoid the bright green patches, he need fear no harm. Tim Sandals on the legendary Dartmoor website gives a personal experience. Following a period of heavy rainfall, I was ambling around the old mine workings at Whiteworks and walking on what appeared to be grass. All of a sudden, the ground underfoot began to rock and roll, and it felt like I was standing on the prow of the Titanic. Luckily, I managed to leap sideways, and luckier still, land on firm ground. At this point, I will take you through the bewildering array of emotions you feel as you slowly sink into the very bowels of Dartmoor. Firstly, there is surprise, as the ground seems to simply open up and slowly begins to drag you down. Then comes fear, as you wonder exactly how far you are going to sink. This is followed by relief as you detect firm ground under your feet and then realise that you have hit rock bottom. I can't describe how you would feel if you didn't hit firm ground, but I would imagine panic would be a good description. This was a basin mere, sorry, basin mire, also known as a feather bed or quaker because, as Sandals explains, it quakes when you step on it, as if you are on a huge, wobbling jelly. There are many different types of bog, including raised, level, string, blanket, quaking and eccentric, which slopes and is dryish at the top and wetter at the lower end. All such landscapes are hazardous, and as the geographer Diane Meredith remarks, profoundly ambiguous, without clear borders and without solid substance below. A bog is formed by layers of sphagnum moss and other plants alive on top with dead but not decomposed debris underneath, and it can easily be deep enough to drown in. Although sphagnum is made up largely of water, parts are strong enough to walk on. Other parts, however, are not. And in a pool and hummock bog where hillocks are separated by standing water, walking from one tussock to another requires care, rhythm, and expertise. A thriller by Michael Gilbert, The Long Journey Home, features a Dartmoor bog used as a murder weapon. The hero, John, is being pursued by three enemies, 
They don't know the moor, but he does. John swung round and ran. He was following a beaten track in the heather. They pounded after him. The track rose gradually until it became a causeway leading out into an open area of mud and water. As he reached the end of the causeway, John's progress changed. He was no longer running, but jumping from tussock to tussock. Morris, more active than the others, was hard on his heels. The tussocks seemed to be stepping stones across a sodden piece of ground. Tricky, but he reckoned that he had only to step where his quarry stepped and he would be safe enough. They were nearly halfway across when he made his first and only mistake. The distance between two of the tussocks was so far apart that it called for a special effort to jump it, but he noticed a third tussock, conveniently placed halfway between the other two. It was when he landed on it that he realised that it was only a patch of weeds and grass afloat on the treacherous surface. The force of his landing took him into the mud up to his waist. John heard him scream, but did not dare to look round. Always at the back of his mind was the thought that if he made one mistake, hesitated when he should have gone on, jumped too far or not far enough, the old woman, deepest and most treacherous of all Dartmoor's morasses, would have him in her claws. She would not let him go. All three of John's pursuers die, suffocated in the mud. And I chose that to quote partly because of the significant name the author chooses for his morass, the old woman. I'm pretty sure he made it up. Please correct me if you know better. But either way, someone thought that this was an appropriate name for a deep, treacherous bog. There's widespread association of malevolent female spirits or creatures with pools, lakes, and rivers. They can be class classified as freshwater mermaids, and the mer in mermaids comes from Old English mere, linked to mire, another name for bog. So let's call these murky women mire maids. Some of them get personal names, Jenny Greenteeth in the Lake District, Peg Powler in the Tees, Nellie Longarms in the Midlands. Some are generic, like lovely web-footed girls said to live in the East Anglian Fens and to have a strong homicidal tendency. Here I would like to share a wonderful bit of wordplay from the blog Strange Wetlands by Leah Stetson, who calls herself Fen Fatal. I wish I'd thought of that first. In Scandinavia, there are tales of men enticed into swamps by Hulda or Hudra, hidden people. From the front, they look like beautiful women, but when they turn around, they have hollow backs like rotten tree trunks, or a tail like a fox, or they simply disappear. They have no backs to them at all. Less alluring is the marsh woman of Hans Andersen's story, The Girl Who Trod on the Loaf. Vain Inga, in her best clothes and new shoes, is on her way to visit her parents, carrying a loaf of bread to give to them. But when she came to a place where the path went over marshy ground, she threw the bread down into the mud to step on it and get across dry shod. But as she stood with one foot on the loaf and lifted the other, the loaf sank down with her, deeper and deeper, and she disappeared wholly, and nothing to be see was to be seen but a black bubbling pool. Where did she go to? Why, she went down to the marsh woman who brews. About the marsh woman, people only know that when the meadows steam in summertime, it is because the marsh woman is brewing. It was down into her brewery that Inger sank, and that's not a place that you can stand for long. 
Every vat stinks enough to make you faint away, and the vats stand thick, enough, thick together, and if there is anywhere a tiny opening between them where you could squeeze through, you can't because of all the damp toads and fat snakes that cluster together there. The Marsh Woman, the Hulda, and their mermaid sisters personify the landscape. Sometimes, one step further, we find the landscape itself gendered as female. In one of several poems about bog bodies, Seamus Heaney wrote of Tolland Man as bridegroom to the goddess. She tightened her talk on him and opened her fen, those dark juices working him to a saint's kept body. This goddess is explicitly sexual, a bride who eats her cake and keeps it. Not all writers go so far as to classify the swamp or marsh as female in and of itself, but some introduce a powerful female figure who is in some sense aligned with the bog and in sympathy with it. In Dunsany's The Curse of the Wise Woman, that role is given to Mrs. Marlin, the wise woman of the title, who lives in a cottage by the side of the bog. Driving there, the narrator passes through rushy lands at first, and at the end of those marshy fields, rising 12 feet above them and frowning at the top with withered heather, lowered the red bog. I saw Marlin's mother come out of the cottage, and her tall but bent dark shape seemed to me, as I saw it then and always since, to be something not on the side of those who won those fields so arduously from the heather, but to be somehow akin to those forces that ruled or blew over the bog and that cared nothing for man. For a moment, as I saw her coming out with her pail, it almost seemed to my fancy as though something in league with the waste dwelt in that cottage. That description of the bog lowering above the cottage struck me as strange when I first read it, but raised bogs are not uncommon, particularly in the Midlands of Ireland. They are deeper than blanket bogs, as much as 12 metres in some cases. Most industrial scale turf removal is from raised bogs. And this is to be the fate of the red bog behind Mrs. Marlin's cottage. Then I heard for the first time of the peat development Ireland syndicate and how a man had come only that morning and taken some measurements. And when Mrs. Marlin had come running out to ask him what he was doing, he had spoken of huts and machinery and so much progress that it had seemed to her that all the blight there was in civilization threatened those willowy lands. Attitudes towards the exploitation of bogs for profit can be widely different. Dunsany says that the bog was to me what the desert is to the Arab he unequivocally opposed its destruction. Bram Stoker, on the other hand, supported investment in peat harvesting and draining, if only to make Ireland more self-financing, freeing it from dependence on England. And in his early novel, The Snake's Pass, he writes of the bog as primordially hostile, the sound it makes when shifting is terrible, resistless, and with a sort of hiss in it, as of seething waters striving to be free. It almost seemed as if some monstrous living thing was deep under the surface and writhing to escape. One of Stoker's characters, and not a villain either, speaks of the bog as if it were a disease of the earth, boasting that scientists can cure bog by both a surgical and medical process. We drain it so that its mechanical action as a sponge may be stopped, and we put in lime to kill the vital principle of its growth. Scientific and executive man asserts his dominance. 
This echoes the views of 17th century physician Gerard Boat, who recommended drainage of the bogs as a remedy, not only for the land, but for the people of Ireland. Compare the phrase, drain the swamp, used by American politicians as a metaphor for all kinds of supposedly cleansing activity. The war on terror, for example. A recent book on Irish boglands, Contentious Terrains, states that colonial landowners imposed a darker, ominous, and therefore gothicised view of bogs in Ireland in order to justify the exploitation and elimination of them. That may well be so, but some of the sources seem not so much to demonise the bog or the Irish as simply to despise them. The writer George Moore, for example, described the Irish race as one that has been forgotten and left behind in a bog hole. It smells of the wet earth. Its face seems as if made of it, and its ideas are moist and dull and as sterile as peat. The equation of Ireland and its people with its bogs, at least in the mouths of the English or Anglo-Irish, tends to be an insult. The term bog trotter has been in use since at least the 18th century as a contemptuous label. The implications even dirtier with the common use of bog house or in contracted form bog to mean toilet, which also goes back further than I thought. The first recorded use of bog house is from 1666 and bogard in that sense even earlier. Nathaniel Ward's Simple Cobbler, first published in 1646, has the magnificently offensive line that the devil thought it wisdom to keep the land, Ireland, as a bogards for his unclean spirits. So Ireland is not just a shit house, but a demonic shit house. <laughs> Incidentally, according to the OED, bogard in that sense is not related to bogart in the folkloric meaning of a bogey beast, but that quote muddies the waters, as you might say. Even a label such as bog gothic, which seems to be a one-man category applied to the books of Patrick McCabe, carries pejorative under or overtones, and apparently McCabe himself isn't too keen on it. As a title for this talk, I meant it to suggest the mystique of the bog as an equivocal environment, sharing the qualities of land and water, simultaneously sterile and fertile, and carrying with it the romance and haunting fear that attaches to many threshold sites. The concept of memory and record is something that comes up often in connection with Bogland. The writer, artist and map maker Tim Robinson has commented that a bog is its own diary and Seamus Heaney suggested that bog is the memory of the landscape or a landscape that remembers everything that happened in it and to it. One way of thinking about that deep memory might be in terms of carbon capture. The peat remembers and preserves the past and to tamper with it risks destroying our future. The relationship between peat bogs and the climate is vital and explained far better than I can do by scientists Matt Amesbury and Tom Rowland on the website Bogology and in their peat blog, or in the work of Tim Robinson, whom I quoted just now. Robinson was passionate and poetic in his descriptions and defense of bogs in general, and Irish bogs in particular. He writes that Roundstone Bog in Connemara spreads wide golden or purple or gray according to the seasons flowing up and over a low rise into a labyrinth of streams with a hundred lakes as far as Erisbeg Hill, which arches its back like an angry cat against the southern sky. Such sights are good for the soul. 
Clifton holds something in trust here for the human spirit forever. Elsewhere, Robinson tells the true story of a group of distinguished scientists who had met on a wet day, on a wet bog, to talk about bogs. Discussion raged, the rain fell, and as the natural philosophers talked, they sank until they were up to their knees in the water. Robinson comments that a nihilistic or anarchic part of us wants the scene to be continued, the assembled mighty intellects to go on sinking until nothing is to be seen on the surface of that lonesome wetland but a few bubbles. What is going on in this fantasy? Mind is being reabsorbed into matter. Humanity's imposition of language, order, meaning is being sucked down and choked off by nature. It's not so much the scientists that Robinson would like to see drown as what he calls the great wrecking machine of commerce that has destroyed so much and threatens still more of the wetlands. Coming back once again to Dunsany, here is his bitter condemnation of that wrecking machine. We came to the bog's edge, and from that high edge, I looked over the land that had always seemed so magical to me, and what I saw is well enough known. I need hardly describe it. A large number of small houses, meanly built. Work had already started on building the dam and putting in the wheel that was to be turned by the water and which would set the machinery clanking. They were there for the purpose of cutting the bog away, not as the turf cutters take it, slowly, as years go by, a few yards in each generation, but working it out as miners work out a stratum of coal. The curse of the wise woman isn't quite fantasy, nor is it magical realism either, but it has the satisfaction and inevitability of fairy tale. As Mrs. Marlin looks at the row of new huts and the men at their mean work, there is a look on her face such as an eagle might wear on a high cliff watching lambs. And she lays her curse on the Peat Development Ireland Syndicate. And rain fell all that night and all the next day, and for most of the night after that it was still raining. It rained a good deal in August, it rained through September, but more men came over from England, and throughout that month they were working on the dark lower layer of peat all along the face of the bank. So far in did they cut, that by the time October came, they could get shelter as they worked from the almost perpetual rain. And perhaps you might guess what happens. I didn't, but when I first read that book, I didn't know anything about bog burst, a natural phenomenon that occurs when massive chunks of bog move as a unit due to liquefaction of the lower layer of peat. If the water in the peat reaches a critical point of saturation, the bog is said to burst and the peat begins to flow, much like lava from a volcano, covering whatever is in its path. A burst in 1697 in Limerick was recalled in a letter published in Philosophical Transactions. The air was somewhat troubled with little whisking winds, seeming to meet contrary ways. And soon after that, to the greater terror and affrightment of a great number of spectators, a more wonderful thing happened, for in a bog stretching north and south, the earth began to move. And Gerard Boat, quoted earlier as advocating bog drainage as a cure for all Ireland's ills, reported that a great noise was heard in the earth like thunder, attended with whirlwinds. Soon after, to the terror of the spectators, the bog began to move. The ground fluctuated like a wave, and the chasms spurted out water and noxious vapours. 
The disturbance of the air mentioned in both those extracts is often observed immediately before a bog burst and was sometimes identified in folklore as a supernatural wind caused by the passing of the fairy host or as advance warning of God's anger. Animals could be aware of the coming disaster before humans noticed anything. A witness to an 1821 bog burst in County Offaly remembered that the, the cows saw it first, for they all began running away from the bog, and we thought it was the flies were at them. But then the barrow and slains, uh, spades, began to tumble about and the bog to move up and down like the waves of a lake. Many more bursts have been recorded, one burying both houses and people under 20 foot of liquid peat, another spreading over more than 30 acres. Those were in Ireland, but such episodes may occur at any bog site. In 1987, in the Swiss Jura Mountains, unusually heavy rainfall following a period of drought caused a great body of peat to slide downhill like a glacier, or as botanist Robert Prager more graphically put it, like outpoured oatmeal porridge. Observers put forward a range of theories to make sense of these catastrophes. William Camden, writing in the late 18th century, wondered if they were the result of electrical disturbance. Around 100 years later, Irish physicist George Francis Fitzgerald proposed, tongue-in-cheek, that bog bursts were common in his country because the frequency of political tremors shook the bogs down mountainsides. More rationally, when the interior of the bog becomes heavily waterlogged, the lower liquid peat gushes out, dragging the more solid upper strata after it. Sometimes slope is a factor, but in a level raised bog, the build-up of water between the layers of peat can cause a flow even without a downhill gradient. And at least in literature, the burst may partly result from ill-advised interference with the natural order. Towards the end of Dunsany's book, the wise woman Mrs. Marlin is dying and the narrator is with her in her cottage. The bog is coming, she said. And a very strange thought indeed came to me then. What, I thought, if it were true? And with this strange thought in my mind, I went out of the cottage. I was in time to see the bank they had undercut arching itself into ridges. They suddenly came towards us. The whole bog was moving. With the weight of years of rain and those last three months, it was coming on over the lower lands and rising higher and higher as it came. For as far as I could see, left or right, it was rippling and waving. It had begun to roar like a tide. It was louder than a tide. It was like a waterfall. The bog came grinding on, turning over and over. It covered the level land. It covered the houses. It rolled the wheel that they had put in the stream to work their machinery for nearly a mile. And still the bog roared on with the weight of all that mass of water behind it. And all the new road lay eight feet under the bog when at last it rested. And that was the end of the Peak Development Ireland Syndicate. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you.